Okay, so before we go further, I'm going to do some more examples for the shear center calculation of open sections, and we're going to do some more calculations then using, well, sorry, I'll introduce the rest of the theory that enables us to do it for closed sections. But I've answered this question a couple of times for students on Slack and having one-to-one -one Zooms, so I'm going to clear up, hopefully, what's been a bit of miss understandings about what shear center actually is and again maybe maybe I've not explained it well enough and that's why I'm doing this hopeful um, explanation now so if you read through Megson if you look through my company notes if you watch the lectures so far there's lots of different ways that we describe the shear center we can describe it as the effective effective center of a torsional rotation when a torque is applied to a section um, we can say that it's the point at which the moment due to the shear um, shear flows is the same as the applied shear force um, and there's also the point where there's, there's a second definition we're going to use when we're looking at or a third definition we can use when we're looking at closed sections but all of those sort of are concepts that we're going to use to help us determine the shear center they don't necessarily help us think about what the shear center is physically so we're going to think about that now and hopefully it will clear some of that up for you guys so let's imagine we're looking at that's a terrible air of oil Let's imagine we're looking at an, a wing from the side. If I can draw an error for you'd hope I'd be able to by now. It's as close as we're going to get. So let's imagine that's the wing tip going up to the root of the aircraft. So this is my aircraft wing. Now we know that on an aerofoil, uh, we've got a pressure distribution. So you'll have a suction. It's not a great attempt to be indicative of anything, a suction and a pressure side, and these can be resolved into a force, um, some sort of resultant force acting on the aerofoil at some point, for example. So we can then load this distribution of pressure acting on the surface can be resolved to a single force um, and a moment, say. So if this was at the aerodynamic center, we'd have a force and a moment acting here. So this means that we can load this aerofoil and this force we can think about forces being applied anywhere from here to here from the leading edge to the trailing edge so what does that mean for this part here so if we've got this wing it's effectively a big cantilever beam and even though we looked at how the sections made up of spars ribs and skin we can imagine it as some sort of cantilever structure structure that's been restrained at the root so if I load this at the tip, and I've got this force acting upwards at the tip, then we can think about what's, what will happen. So we can have a, uh, let's say, let's call it the leading edge. I should stop calling it the tip, really. Let's say leading edge. So outside of aerodynamics, let's imagine that I'm able to push upwards here and able to push upwards here. Let's think about what happens. So if this is my undeformed shape, then if I push upwards at the leading edge, then we might get some total vertical displacement and some torsional twist. So we've got something that ends up, okay, let's just, I'm gonna stop trying to draw an error for because I apparently cannot do it at all today. And I'm going to copy this. So we might get some, if I push it at the front, then we get some sort of displacement and a torsion. Okay, so we get vertical displacement plus nose up torsion. So we're going to say this is H is my vertical displacement and my nose up torsion. Let's call this delta theta. And let's put this here. Let's get rid of that delta. Let's say this is delta delta theta. And we said this is positive. So we'll call this positive here. That tends to be the definition for moments. Positive nose or leading edge up. So if we load at the tip, we get this vertical displacement. H is tends to be vertical displacement and a nose up at the trailing edge. Let's see what happens if we load it there. You can you probably don't need me to 
draw this, but we're going to do it anyway. So we load it at the trailing edge. And very similarly, we've got our aerofoil. And if I push it at the trailing edge, we're going to have a combination of this vertical displacement and also a nose down. So we, let's do those together. We've got up and then that way. Put it there. So we get still, H is this vertical displacement, and let's say now we've got delta theta, and that's now going to be negative. Negative because it's leading edge down, okay? So leading edge up here, leading edge down here. So we can then think about these two loading positions. So the loading position at the leading edge the loading position at the trailing edge, those are the two limits of where we could load this aerofoil. So we could then plot let's say x location, which is the loading so that's my loading position and I could then plot versus that the delta theta so when I load it at the leading edge, which is the leftmost position I can load it at, I get a big positive delta theta. If I load it here, let's say this is non-dimensional, so going from 0 to 1, 1 would be the trailing edge. Then I'd have a big negative displacement here. Okay, so here. And then if we're going to just make the assumption we've got some nice, a nice linear relationship between these two, we probably don't for most, um, for most com complicated structures but there'll be some distribution between the loading position at the front and the loading position at the edge. So wherever this crosses the axis here, this point where it crosses the axis, this is the shear center. And what does that mean? So this means that we've got this delta theta is zero. So that means if we load this here at this shear center, and again, this is all just some diagram I've drawn, none of this has been calculated obviously, but if we have now our aerofoil, and say we've calculated that position here, wherever that crossed the axis, let's say for argument's sake this was x equals 0 0.5, meaning it's at the center of this section, then if I load at this position here now with this vertical force, all I would get is loading here, I would only get this vertical displacement, no torsion. So when we load at the shear center of a cantilever wing like this, when we load at the shear center, we only get this bending displacement, we get no torsion. Okay, so when we load at the shear center, we get bending only, no torsion, and that's the example, that's the, the definition that makes sense and is useful for us to use and will help us think about this. Now, obviously, shear center, shear center then is a function of a 2D shape. So if we've got our wings cross section, then we said there's probably spars in here. There'll be, let's pretend we're not between the ribs at the moment, but we've effectively got then a skin. Uh, let's draw so we've got spars and we've got the skin around this we've then effectively got a thin wall structure that looks like that okay so we can determine using the methodologies that we're going to be building up over the next week or so what the shear center of this is like and that's then a, it just exists for a two-dimensional section, but it's useful for us because it will then define what we said was the elastic axis of the wing. So if we've got our wing like this, and we can def define, for example, cutting sections through it, we can define shear centers, then our elastic axis, 
would be a line drawn between, between those shear centers. And that would mean that that is effectively where our wing will want to twist around. Okay, so hopefully that helps us understand a little bit better what shear center actually physically means, okay? I tend to find that Megson, the book, is really good for understanding a lot of the involved internal theory surrounding what shear flow actually does, but it doesn't get to the nub of what shear center physically means for a structure, and hopefully this helps us. Just remember this, that we load at the front, we get nose up, load at the back, we get nose down, or trailing nose down, as a consequence, somewhere in the middle there must be a point where we only get bending, no torsion, to our shear center, okay? So we load it here, and if we load it here, this bad boy only goes up. We don't get any torsion, okay? Cool, hopefully that's helping, okay? Um, like I say, I helped a few students with this, so if you were struggling with that and this has helped, hopefully that's useful. Um, I will continue with giving you guys more examples for this, and I'll see you all next week. Take care.